If you have ever heard the topic self-hosting but don't know what it means, then this video is about you. In this video, we are going to cover the very fundamental topics related to home labs. We will cover all the fundamentals related to home servers to get you started on your first home lab. We will go through the choice of equipment you can make, what kind of services can you run on your server, and so much more. So without wasting any more time, let's get started. Let's start with the most fundamental tool you will need to set up your home lab. You will need a PC to act as a server. You have two options here. Either you host everything at your home or you can select a server that is located at a remote place that you can access. No matter which route you take, as long as you host your services yourself, it is probably fine. I do both. I run some services on outside servers like websites etc. while I use others at my home for my personal use. With remote servers you have basically two options. Either a virtual private server or a dedicated root server. For the most part you won't see any difference between the two. There are plenty of services which can provide you with these kinds of servers so you can host your services. A simple Google search will give you plenty of results. If you decide to host your services at your home, you want a server that is power efficient. Typically newer devices are much more power efficient than the older ones while providing the same or more processing power. I really like the small form factor PCs like Intel Nukes, B-Link series PCs and the like. Single board computers like Raspberry Pi also make very good servers. They have very low idle power consumption and the noise levels are extremely low. But these PCs are not very extensible. So if you want to customize your system, you will have to go to the other options. If you want to build a NAS or a network attached storage for your backup or for your media streaming, you will need to spend some money on decent hard drives. A large, fast and dependable hard drive is essential if you want to build a decent NAS. No matter how much money you spend on a NAS device, if the hard drive is not up to the mark, you could potentially lose all your data. For a NAS setup, always go for NAS dedicated drives as they are much more resistant and built specially for NAS. They can absorb higher level of shocks and they are designed to typically work 24-7. You will also need to decide which RAID configuration you want depending on the number of disks you use. If you are hosting at your own premises, you are going to need a dedicated router. If you have an internet subscription from your ISP, you will already have a router. However, more often than not, this router is not very good. I will advise you to spend some money on a decent router and it will make your life so much easier. A dedicated router will also avoid you to set up your services again if you change your ISP. Try to get the routers which supports OpenWRT or PFSense as they will give you much more control over your network. To use this router you will need to either create a DMZ or make your ISP router pass through so that all your network traffic is directed to your own router. Also you will need a static IP from your ISP. Sometimes ISPs provide you with a dedicated IP when you get their subscriptions. Other times you will have to pay an additional fee for static IP. In addition to that you will also need a good internet connection. A decent internet connection, preferably fiber, will make your remote connection experience extremely smooth. And before we proceed further, kindly press like and subscribe down below to stay updated on this channel. The next thing on our list is the choice of operating system. If you want to build a NAS, go for the operating systems built directly for this purpose as they will offer much more flexibility and control. Some of the most important operating systems in this domain are ToolNAS, Android and OpenMediaVault. These operating systems will work much better as a NAS and will give you much more resilience over your data. If you want to run some other services, you have basically two options. Either virtual machines or bare metal operating system. If you need multiple operating systems running on your system for different services, I would advise you to use a hypervisor in this scenario. Proxmox is one of the best ones out there and it's free but with certain restrictions. In order to run a hypervisor, you will need some extra space and system resources 
but it's not too big of a deal. The other option is to just go the bare metal route and you will install the operating system without any kind of a hypervisor. If you want to go the bare metal route, choose a lightweight operating system. 99% of the time you will choose a Linux based distro. When selecting a distro for your home server, make sure that it's lightweight and doesn't come pre-installed with things you don't want on your home server. There are plenty of options for server distros and this video will be unbearably large if I tried to focus on them. My personal favorite is Debian Stable. Although it's not very cutting edge, it's a rock solid distribution and I have never had troubles with unstability on this distro. There are other options like Fedora or even Arc, but it's for extremely tech savvy people. Ubuntu is also a decent server distro, but I'm not a fan of Ubuntu. When choosing a distro, don't opt for desktop environment as 99% of the time you will be logging into the server from the command line. Also make sure that SSH is enabled for you to remotely access your server. Next, you will want to decide how you want to run your services. That is, if you want to manage each service individually on your own or you want to use some kind of tools. If you want to manage everything on your own, you will probably need Docker. Docker is a tool that I consider an absolute necessity for your home servers. Otherwise, you will spend too much time trying to figure out which services are conflicting with each other. Learning Docker takes some time, but once you go through the initial hurdles, Docker makes everything a walk in the park. Docker by default provides much more security by containerization and setting it up takes some time. But once it's done, it's easily reproducible on other systems. Now, if you want dedicated tools for your home server management, there are plenty of options for that as well. With these tools, you can manage your home server directly from your browser. Some examples of these tools are Umbrel, CasOS, and Tippy. I have created dedicated videos for each of these platforms. Be sure to check them out. A lot of these tools are not very stable at the moment, so use them with extreme precaution. The only one that I found somewhat stable is Tippy. In your self-hosting journey, you are bound to make mistakes, some minor, some bigger, and a backup is what is going to save you when the unfortunate day comes. Make backups regularly and religiously. Always follows the 3 2 1 rule. Free backups media and one offside and preferably air gapped. Always make sure that your backups are restorable. I have broken my server a couple of times and backups are what saved my most important data. If you are self-hosting, you would like to have access to your server all the time, even when you are not at your home. There are multiple ways of doing this. The most secure solution is to never expose your services through the internet. However, this is not the most practical solution. The second option is to use a VPN to your home which would encrypt all the communication between you and your server when you are outside. The third option is to use a reverse proxy which would provide you HTTPS support and will encrypt your communication. You will also need to have a domain for it to work. The most common reverse proxies used for home servers are Nginx reverse proxy, traffic and caddy. I recommend using caddy as it is very beginner friendly. To access your servers remotely, always use password with a decent complexity and it's even better to use SSH keys to log in rather than a simple password. And finally, the most exciting part deciding what services you want to run on your server. It all depends on your use case, but here are a few suggestions. The most popular one is Nextcloud, which is a Google Drive alternative. It lets you sync your data with your server in real time. I have already made a couple of tutorials to install it on your server. Be sure to check them out. Another great alternative is Image. Image is an alternative for Google Photos. You can upload your photos from your phone or from your PC onto your server. There are as many apps as you want. And here is a dedicated list of self-hosted services on GitHub. Be sure to check them out and install whatever service you want on your server. In this video, we have gone through the very fundamental aspects of setting up your home server. The list of topics discussed in this video is not comprehensive and there is still plenty of things left to discuss. 
This video is meant to give you a quick overview of what things you need to consider while setting up a home lab. In the future videos, we will discuss these topics in detail. I hope you like this video. Be sure to check out other videos as well and see you later in the next video.